The film stars Betty Davis as Margot, an established theatre actress who appoints Eve, an aspiring actress, as her personal assistant after she's fed a sob story. However, Margot is unaware of Eve's real intentions as the seemingly timid but secretly ruthless injuing inserts herself into the lives of the aging Broadway star. The film, written and directed by Joseph L. Mankiewicz and produced by Daryl F. Zanuck, is based on a 1946 short story and sub subsequent 1949 radio drama by Mary Orr, The Wisdom of Eve, though Orr doesn't receive a screen credit. As I said, the film stars Betty Davis as Margot Channing, a highly regarded but aging Broadway star, and Anne Baxter as the title's Eve Harrington, who is an ambitious initial, initial young man who maneuvers herself into Channing's life, ultimately threatening Channing's career and her personal relationships. The film also co-stars Celeste Holm, George Sanders, Gary Merrill, and Hugh Marlowe, and features Thelma Ritter and Marilyn Monroe in one of her earliest roles. The film was nominated and received a record. The film received a record 14 nominations at the 23rd Academy Awards, becoming the only film in Oscar history to receive four female acting nominees for Davis Baxter as Best Actress, Home and Ritter as Best Supporting Actress. And it went on to win six awards, including Best Picture as well as Best Director and Best Adapted Screenplay. I saw this for the first time again quite recently as I am teaching it as part of my film studies. Andy, this is your first go around for all of us. Um, yes, this is one of those films that's been on my Oscar nominated films that I had not got around to. Those who've been listening to the show since the very early days will know that this was a thing during the lockdown that every week Lee picked out an Oscar nominated film that I'd never seen. And we, it was quite aghast at many of the films that I said that I'd not seen. <laughs> And this is one of the ones that when I've said recently, that's still on my list. Again, Lee was quite aghast that I've never seen it. And I know that some of our listeners out there, such as Lindsay Story, she was absolutely surprised when I told her a few weeks ago that I'd still not seen it. Uh, but I finally watched it. And you know what? Man, this stands up well. This really holds it, up for a modern It's a weird audience. film, isn't it? It's so... It, it could be contemporary. Yeah, I mean, the Broadway set, if you were to make this film now, the Broadway setting would become Hollywood and it yeah. would become the film industry. And the underlying current, the underlying suggestion of some um, more romantic pursuits that Eve might be going for would be played out a bit more explicitly. Um, but obviously back in the 50s, they were very cautious to keep it as subtext, but it's a marvelous subtext eve is obsessed yeah. with Mar margo uh you know at the start of the film it's obsession of from a fan's point of view but over the film you start to get the feeling that there's more to it than that as she starts her machinations to basically start to control elements of margo's life and sideline her and push her to one side but is she doing that because she wants margo all to herself and is jealous of the attention that Margot gets from those around her. Meanwhile, Margot, marvellously portrayed by Betty Davis. I mean, oh, wow, what a star she was. She was amazing. Yeah. But she's starting to doubt where she fits within her career because she's getting old. And this is something that, like I said, if you made it now, it'd be set in Hollywood. Because this is something that echoes through the Hollywood industry, that once actresses get to a certain age, they kind of start to get given sideline roles and they start to get pushed to one side. And this is a film that explores that aspect of the entertainment industry that whilst male, male leads can go on to be 70 years old and still fronting things, females always get to a certain age and start to struggle to find their place and have to decide whether they can still get away with playing younger characters or whether they need to step aside and just play the background characters. And this film tackles everything in one. I was shocked because I only knew this. It's not even subtext, is it? That the ageism no. thing. It's it's it's, it's a absolutely front and center. Plot. 
And you know, I didn't realize because I only knew about this film like that it was a it was a film from the synopsis about obsession and desire and you know impersonation. I didn't realize there were so many more elements within here, and it's it's kudos to such a tight screenplay that for the whole lot of the runtime. You're constantly engaged, you're constantly drawn in and constantly surprised and on the edge of your seats at points. I was absolutely captivated by this. And I can say right now that I, I'll probably be re-watching this within the next month again because I, I felt that like, there was so much going on that I want to just really delve into it even further. It's a, a classic film in in every sense of the word from fantastic performances especially from betty davis but you can't talk about this film without talking about ann baxter as he eve harrington who just plays a, a character who transforms uh, and when it suddenly becomes clear what her intentions are the film goes from becoming a from being a drama about theater to suddenly being almost a dark comedic thriller and it does it so effortlessly. Uh, beautiful cast. Um, George Sanders as the uh, as Addison DeWitt, brilliantly titled Addison DeWitt, oh. who again has uh, more of an eye on to what's going on than anyone else within the story and um, becomes involved quite heavily within the plot. But as Andy said, this could this could easily be remade and has been the story has been used a couple of times, including um, Magic Mike to a degree, um, yeah. Pedro Aldemar's All About My Mother. Yet yeah, you could even say that this year's Saltburn has no, oh, yeah, absolute absolutely. echoes of All About Eve within it because that is, if you look in that one, it's a class divide that is being used as a tale of obsession and desire for someone on the other part of that divide who then starts to take over the life and twist things and enable themselves to become that person, destroy the life ar lives around them and step into the shoes of the person that they've been destroying. It is a kind of story idea that has been represented in various ways over the years. And because it's been represented in so many like various ways in more modern takes, you'd think that like the old film will feel a bit like twee as a result, but it actually stands so well as its own film. It's it's testament to the writing of it that Betty Davis had a reputation um, within the industry, and she was known to be quite difficult to work with. And she would make changes to scripts, and she insisted on like you know taking control of projects. And I believe that um, Mankiewicz was warned by one of one of their former directors, Edmund Golding that Betty Davis would come along and grind him down into fine powder, expecting her to come thundering onto set and take full control. But Mankiewicz found that she worked absolutely perfectly, didn't change anything, and she had the best on-set behaviour because she just saw the script was so finely tuned that there was nothing that needed to change in there. This film, as we said, was regarded as one of the starts of queer cinema with its undertones of a relationship relationship within the film also the film uh, has found great success within gay audiences especially um the campy overtones down to yes. mainly betty davis's quips sardonic one-liners and it's generally um generally has a, a strong gay fan base however the film is a classic in its own right if you've not had chance to see all about eve and there are so many references and quotes that you will recognize from the film that you are going to be you're going to be on there i'll start again you will be part of that bumpy ride because it is an absolute classic of cinema when you think about 1950s cinema and you think was it risque you think about black and white movies they might put you off give yourself a, give yourself the honor the pleasure of watching all about eve you can't close off talking about all about eve as well without mentioning the marvellous cinematography from Milton Kresner and the score from Alfred Newman that absolutely, it's a marvellous looking film, 
that captures the it captures the glamour, but in a darkened kind of way. And the score just complements everything underneath it. And it builds, it builds your attention, it builds your engagement throughout. It's it's just I can see why it won awards at the Oscars. It's an absolute classic of a film. Um, I did read that a rather interesting tidbit that life imitated art 30, 30 odd years later when Anne Baxter stepped into Betty Davis's shoes, replacing her on the series Hotel in 1983 after Davis fell ill and Davis never returned to the show, which was quite a... <laughs> life a imitating art. Bit meta. A significant point of like metaness that actually happened. But it, it's the whole idea that like younger up-and-comers will come across and they will take over someone's life and push the older performers to one side only to find that, as we see at the end of All About Eve, that the same is going to happen to them at some point. Because when Eve suddenly gets a fan who's helping her, and you know where that's going to lead, it's a classic. Like Lee said, if you've never seen it, you definitely need to see it. I've only just watched it for the first time in this past week, and I absolutely can see the love that people have for it. I just want to point out there was a fantastic, uh, critically successful stage version uh, the Noel Coward Theatre in London uh, a couple of years ago, pr just pre-COVID, which starred, and you can see the casting is fantastic, Gillian Anderson as Margot Channing and uh, Lily James as he Eve Harrington. And Lily James as Eve Harrington. Well worth seeing. The film stars James Kahn as Paul Sheldon. Kathy Bates as Annie Wilkes. And this is the first Stephen King novel to win an Oscar. And King himself has stated that Misery is one of his top 10 favorite film adaptation. It was a huge success, uh, received positive reviews from Columbia Pictures and was a box office success, with Bates' performance in particular drawing widespread drawing widespread praise from critics and an Academy Award for Best Actress at the 63rd Academy Awards. Just before we started uh, recording this, I said to Andy, when did this come out? I can't believe it was 1991. Yes. Um, this film still has an absolute impact. I'd read the book prior to see the film, so I knew, knew the plot. But I, I think Rob Reiner, a little bit like Frank Darabont, is one of those directors who works in King's universe and keeps the essence of, of King, even though they might change elements, and there's a, a massive element change in the film on book, but they keep the heart of Stephen King in it, and that's why I think their adaptations are always successful. Yes, uh... Released in the UK, May 1991. It did release in the US at the back end of 1990. Yes, there were days when we had to wait six months for things to come out in the UK. Uh, I knew that this was going to be 1991 because I got to see this 18-rated film because I was 18. Oh, right. I, well, that's yeah. a good way to, uh, to recognise <laughs> it there. That's how I knew because... I saw this on the big screen. Me and my mates went along to see it because we're all big Stephen King's fans. I'd read this book beforehand. They hadn't. And I remember when we saw it, I came out of it, just wanted to go straight back in and watch it again because it was just it was just Stephen King perfection. I would rank this potentially as my favourite Stephen King adaptation. I oh, think really? It's, I love Stephen King. I mean, I love Stephen King in general, but I love him more when he's not tapping into Supernatural but he's tapping into the horror of humanity. And this, for me, was one of his books that tapped into that because it, it it drew on King's own worry that he would have a stalker fan out there who would manage to capture him and uh, torture him into writing the perfect story just for them. And Rob Rayner and William Goldman, let's not forget that this is a William Goldman script, absolutely tap into that book and adapt it almost, almost 100% perfect. There's only a few small changes. There's one change that some people say is quite major, and that's in the hobbling moments. But I think it works so much better the way that he's hobbled on film. And it's just, 
it's just one of those slow burning tension mounted films that starts off as you know he's been saved by Annie Wilkes after he's crashed his vehicle in the snow and she's a bubbly like excitable very giddy fan who's taking care of him and like oh the phones are down but I'll I've told your agent and the message like once the roads are clear we'll be able to sort something out but it's after she reads his latest book and she gets to the end I mean, she, as she's reading it she keeps coming into Paul and showing excitement she's like oh is he going to oh what's going to happen what's going to happen and then the when it flip the film flips is after she's read the final chapter of his most recent book and he's killed off the character that she loves and has even named her pet pig after and the filmmaking technique suddenly becomes a lot more claustrophobic because even though it's set mostly within the house it feels quite open it qu it's well lit sunlight beaming through but as soon as she steps into that room calling him a dirty bird you dirty dirty bird everything suddenly becomes very tense and from that point in this film i was palpitations even watching it this week like i've said before there's for those films that you've watched so many times that you can just kind of watch them and they're on in the background and you don't get drawn into them but you know what's happening because you've already seen it as soon as i was watching this that was my only attention because it's just a masterclass in everything coming together perfectly. Perfect screenplay by William Goldman. Perfect direction. The perfect screenwriter. Yeah. And perfect casting with James Kahn and Kathy Bates. Absolutely magnificent Let, over them. Let's talk about this because while the film is taut and it is frightening, it's basically it's two hander between uh, the two lead characters. Now, casting, well, originally. Uh, Sheldon was offered to William Hurt, uh, Kevin Klein, Michael Douglas, Harrison Ford, Robert De Niro, Pacino, Richard Dreyfuss, Gene Hackman, Redford, but they all turned it down. Warren Beatty was at one point interested, but filming on Dick Tracy ran over. And then someone suggested James Kahn, who agreed to play the part, and with Kahn commenting that he was attracted to how Paul Sheldon was a role unlike any other that's been played. He's a totally reactionary character. Um, he's not the tough guy. He is trapped for the majority of the film. And it's about, it's a film about emasculation. And you needed the perfect Annie to be able to be able to deliver that, that in turn, to be able to deliver that isolated terror. Angelica Houston and Bette Midler were both offered the role. Uh, Midler would later say that she deeply regretted the decision, but it was William Goldman who suggested that Kathy Bayes, then a relative unknown, should portray Annie Wilkes. And the rest really is, well, film history. Yeah. It um, was a genuinely horrific, at times, funny performance in the way that it's mm. written. And she, she sometimes plays it very, very broad. But there's that twinkle in the eye, that that cold twinkle, that something horrific will will happen, and and that's what makes the film work. It's the rise in tension because the audience are generally one step ahead in in this film. Yeah. Uh, Khan and Bates had very different approaches to acting, and it caused a bit of tension on set. Khan is very much uh, he believes in rehearsing as little as possible and just drawing on the moments and improvising around. Whereas Bates, coming from a theatre background, was very used to practising and rehearsing and getting everything right before you start shooting. And at one point, she turned around to Rob Rayner and said that Khan was not attending to relate or listen to her to come to some compromise. And Rayner smartly just said, use that frustration and play that back at him. And that's how she gets that frustration at the character that she's frustrated because he's told the wrong story she drew upon her own frustrations towards how Khan was repl replying to her and I think it really does make it work well the the relationship might be strained between the two actors but that's how it should be for those two characters um I did read that Khan turned up hungover for one day of filming and all of the scenes that were shot that day were completely unusable but Rayner had told Khan that um, there was a problem in the lab and it hadn't developed properly so that he didn't like, you know, kind of make the actor feel guilty. But Air Khan learned a few days later that it wasn't anything to do with the labs 
and offered his own money to cover the lost money to the studio. I mean, it, the guy, Khan was... Just a legend, just wasn't he? He's a legend, consummate professional who just cared about what he was delivering and cared about the cared about like the whole projects around him. But it was such smart casting. Even the, even when you look at the minor casting, because even though this is mostly just these two people, it would be too much if there was no one else there. Because like I say, the tension building in that household built and built and built, and you could potentially have a heart attack out of the tension. But they pack it out the cast with characters such like Buster and Virginia, um, played by Richard Farnsworth and Francis Sternhagen. Buster being the local sheriff law enforcer who is kind of piecing together what's happened to Paul Sheldon uh, bit by bit. And those little bits and moments where it flips over to him and his laid back, cool, calm, but very investigative nature and his, his rather oversexed aging wife who uh, is constantly flirting with him, even though he's she's his deputy. They add some comic relief at much-needed junctures in the film, and they are just so charming. And you grow to love them, only for typical King fashion <laughs> to play out. I, I think I can guess what happens. <laughs> Sorry, I'll start again. I think we can guess what happens. Yeah, the great uh, Frances Sternhagen, uh, one of my all-time all -time favourite actresses. She was brilliant. Of course, as you mentioned earlier, Andy, uh, a lot of fans were upset by the removal of one of the key sequences. Um, and William Goldman actually wanted to keep it in. And that is when Annie severs one of Paul Sheldon's feet with an axe. Um, Goldman apparently loved the scene and argued for it to be included. But Reiner insisted that it would change. Um, Reiner insisted that it changed to her breaking his ankles um and then goldman came around sub subsequently wrote that this was the correct decision as the visual depiction of an amputation would cause the audience to actually hate annie instead of actually empathizing with her and her trauma and her madness this is a near on perfect film uh, with my all-time favorite screenwriter how could it not be and rob rainer who has proved time and time again that he can turn his hand to almost any genre. He has that dexterity as a director to be able to play in 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 every field and, and does it so well. Um, this film is considered to be a classic for many reasons and understandably so. It plays with all the tricks of, of tension and fear, but at the heart of it, it is about two people who are suffering in very, very different ways and due to fantastic performances, the building of tension, the film is incredibly taut, it works. And while it might not be my favorite King adaptation, I'm looking at you, Dead Zone, it's certainly up there as one of the best Stephen King adaptations so far. We mentioned earlier in the show, as our question of the week, about needle drops in films. And uh, there's Liberace's rendition of Moonlight Sonata will never be heard the same way because it was used marvellously over the hobbling scene in this. The, uh, the whole use of Liberace music, who'd have ever thought that Liberace would suddenly become part of a soundtrack of the film? Because I never did. But it's Annie Wilkes has a fascination with the music of him, so it's, very, it's used perfectly in the background throughout some of the key moments in this film. But that hobbling scene, Everything about that hobbling scene is just built up perfectly from Moonlight Sonata playing uh, that you straight away know that something's not right. She's going to do something here. Right up to the swinging of the hammer and saying, I love you, Paul. And James Kahn's reactions, James Kahn playing someone in crippling pain is it's just perfect acting class. You genuinely believe that she's took at his ankle with that hammer and the, the the prosthetic effects that they use for it, it still makes me basically crease up squirming on that scene as it's building up to it. And when it, yeah, hits, it, did, it did have that effect. Oh, it, it's everything in that scene is just built to perfection because it slowly builds up to, you know, something's going to happen. And then when it happens, Oh man, it's, it's perfect filmmaking from a really good story by Stephen King perfectly adapted to the screen.